So, um, uh, thank you, and um, it's a big pleasure to be here. Uh, it's great to have followed such uh, wonderful talks, and I particularly, um, uh, Mercedes has already highlighted for malaria the importance of understanding social and local vulnerabilities as well as uh, climate, and then Jeff has already emphasized the importance of water, and then Matt on temperature, so I have a sort of great platform, if you like, for the talk that I want to give you, but my talk is a little bit different in, uh, to, in its focus. And that is that uh, we talk a lot about what climate is doing, but what are we going to do about it? That's the basic essence. And what are people doing about it now? I come from the International Research Institute for Climate and Society, which is based at Columbia. And um, uh, our, it's a mission-driven institute, and our mission is not only just to understand and anticipate, which we've learned a lot about this morning, but also to help society manage aspects of climate variability and change. And it's the management side that I'm going to emphasize in my talk with, where I hope I can add uh, some value to the, pr the previous speakers. And there are many colleagues of mine at the IRI and elsewhere that um, are involved in these studies and contribute uh, to my thinking in general. I did want to mention that I woke up at, this morning at 5 o'clock from a nightmare. And it was, I don't normally have nightmares. I don't remember my dreams that much. But it was a big night. It was like a real shock. And I had dreamt that I was going on stage to sing at the opera. And I knew I couldn't sing. And not only that, they hadn't told me what the tune was. And there was this, anyway. So I am very glad that it's not my nightmare. And I'm sure you're very glad that I'm not going to sing opera. Instead, I'm going to tell you something about how we can think about the way climate and environment is changing and how we might be anticipating changes and what we can actually use that information for. That's the essence of my talk. So my focus is on malaria, and we've heard um, some things about the changes in uh, malaria transmission over time and the history of disease, etc. This is a useful map in terms of its, uh, the spatial distribution uh, of malaria over the last century, and I particularly want you to focus on changes uh, post, um, uh, uh, that happened after the Second World War. And these changes were really driven by the eradication campaigns and um, I'll give you a little bit of uh, information around that. But over time, you can see the reduction, if you like, from this global disease to a disease of the tropics and a disease which is particularly uh, stubborn in terms of getting rid of it in Africa. And uh, if we go and look at the phases of malaria control and the, the sort of policy environment that's happened since the Second World War, and there was this control phase that came in with the League of Nations, the development of the global uh, control uh, and uh, strategies, uh, followed by an eradication phase, a resurgence of disease, chaos in the 1980s, and from the 1990s, hope. And these all relate to policy changes that happened at the global scale. These policy changes are incredibly significant in terms of what you're talking about, whether or not it's going to actually influence anything in terms of disease, uh, transmission, and morbidity and mortality uh, for people who are currently uh, suffering and dying from malaria. I and mean, there's still uh, you know, over a million deaths a year from malaria uh, estimated. Yeah? So um, of particular importance, if you like, in terms of the hope are those uh, uh, policy changes that happened in the 1990s, which was the adoption of a new control strategy by ministers of health uh, globally, and how that changed into a global malaria strategy uh, for the world, and particularly the launch of Rollback Malaria in 1998. But we're really going to pick up the story with the, uh, in 2000 with the development of the Millennium Development Goals. Now, one thing I wanted to ask is, could I have a quick show of hands, roughly, do you identify yourself more on the climate side or on the health side? So if I, that, I just give me a sense of the audience. So climate, health. Ah, interesting. OK. Well, the health people will know will be much more familiar with this, but maybe some of the climate people will not uh, be quite so familiar. So the Millennium Development Goals, which are these eight major goals uh, around the eradication of poverty and universal education, equality of women, uh, reductions in child mortality, improvement in maternal health, combating HIV, malaria, and other diseases, environmental sustainability, and global partnerships for development. These are the big things that the UN agencies and the global decision-making community signed up for in 2000, and malaria was central to most of them. Uh, because malaria has a huge impact on child mortality and on maternal mortality. It's a direct one under number six. 
where it's named explicitly, but it also affects education, it affects um, uh, poverty eradication, etc. So malaria, over the last 10 years, has gained the global stage and gained huge amounts of resources relative to the virtual zero resources or very low resources uh, that were available to malaria control post the eradication phase, so from 1970s, 1980s, and early 1990s. There was very little resources going into malaria. So when you see what's happening on the malaria policy side, and then you bring in what's happening on the climate uh, change side, this was the original PhD, we've seen this graph before, uh, from Pim Martins, where the first, if you like, attempts to relate climate change and, uh, to malaria transmission and if you like, the focus of the climate change community had been, and rightly so in one way, to grab the attention of policymakers, to sort of somehow make climate change real, and uh, to do it by saying, look, it's actually going to impact uh, the places uh, that you're concerned about, Europe and the US. Um, this may have backfired in one way or another, um, because part of it is that the global health community did not buy onto climate change for at least another 10 years. And uh, Margaret Chan, she's a director, uh, she gave the first speech of any director on climate change uh, at Bethesda in December 2007, 10 years after those initial studies and a long time after, if you like, there had been a lot of discussion in the literature on climate change and health. And one of the reasons, maybe uh, these people here, and um, uh, the Gates Foundation have re-energized in many ways malaria control through their resourcing of malaria research and uh, control commodity um, development, etc. And in particular, they have refocused the global health community on eradication again. So in the 1950s, there was a global strategy for eradication of malaria with DDT and chloroquine, which got rid of malaria out of the US, got rid of it out of... Um, uh, large parts of Europe and uh, large parts of Asia, and then malaria resurged in many of the, uh, not in the US, in Europe, but in, in parts of Asia. Uh, but now we have a return of the idea that you can eradicate malaria. Anybody who knows about malaria knows it's an incredibly complicated disease, and when Bill Gates announced this in 2007, there was sort of shock and horror in the audience uh, from many uh, malariologists who thought this is really not possible and not a sensible policy objective. However, he has been very effective at wooing the um, uh, health uh, community. And um, that is now, elimination is now part of the global strategy for many uh, countries. And if you look at the difference, just for some quick definitions, uh, you have control, which is basically going every year, trying to just main, uh, reduce the impact of malaria. Elimination, trying to get malaria down to zero incidence uh, in specific regions of the world. And then eradication, really getting a permanent reduction uh, to zero in the worldwide incidence of infection. This is like smallpox eradication. Yeah? And then extinction is really when there's no parasite left on the planet. And so I don't think people are quite considering that. But it's moved the whole policy agenda again away from control through elimination towards eradication. So you have, if you like, in two different agendas going on, a climate change agenda predicting malaria into the future and a malaria agenda predicting the end of malaria. So what are we going to do in this discussion? Yeah. So one of the things that we've been doing at the IRI is thinking very much of climate as an opportunity, as a way to help public health decision making improve their decisions to get to that objective of eradicating malaria faster. And the way we're interested in doing this is using climate information to help us better understand the mechanisms of disease, to better estimate populations at risk, to improve our understanding of seasonality and the timing of interventions, to monitor and predict year-to-year -year variations in incidents, including early warning systems, to monitor and predict longer-term trends, um, but really not that long, yeah? Not 100-year trends in malaria, but maybe 10 or 20-year trends and then improving the assessment of the impact of interventions. And this is by removing climate as a confounder. I want to come back to this one in particular, the last one, because it may be not something that you've thought about uh, in too much detail. So when we're thinking about taking science and moving it into policy, one of the things that uh, obviously you can tell from my accent that I'm English, and in England we have um, a national health system. And as part of that process, which is very important in the 1980s, evidence-based public health policy 
is an absolute mantra of the culture of public health services. And that has spread everywhere. Now you see evidence-based this, evidence-based that. We have to know what the value of whatever intervention is for a particular public health outcome. And of course, there's lots of disputes about that. And so there's a process, if you like, of thinking about how to get evidence into policy and practice. And I love this um, uh, little article by um, Sarah Nutley and uh, uh, Davis. And it um, basically comes up with some lessons, which I found incredibly useful in terms of orienting my own thinking. And the first is get agreement as to the nature of evidence. If you don't get the agreement on the nature of evidence, people just argue no policy decisions are made and nothing happens in terms of delivery. Take a strategic approach to the creation of evidence together with the development of a cumulative knowledge base. It's no point having one study saying one thing and another study saying another thing. You really have to build a storyline if you're going to impact on policymakers. Have effective dissemination of knowledge together with the development of a means of access to knowledge, and that's changing dramatically now, of course, with the uh, internet, etc. And create initiatives to increase the uptake of evidence by both policy and practice. And so what I'm going to present on you is some of the work that we've been doing in this context. Uh, first of all, the mechanisms issue. Very, very important, understanding disease mechanisms. I would like to just um, make a comment is we have to understand the mechanisms and what the drivers are as they actually work in the field, not just the lab, because you'll see that there are other things that come into play in field environments that you might not be so aware of in the, in the laboratory. But um, understanding mechanisms is an extremely important part of all vector-borne diseases and very important for policy. Because if you say climate is having this impact to a policymaker, one of the first questions is how? And if they don't believe the answer, then they don't really believe the process. Uh, we have global maps of malaria, very important, the map project. We've seen the slides from it earlier on, putting together these global maps of transmission. But what's actually happening at the national level? Uh, this is Ethiopia, where I've been working for a number of years. And they have numerous maps of uh, malaria transmission across the country. Uh, most of them are created from uh, environmental information, rainfall and temperature, maybe NDVI is included, and, uh, or altitude. And those environmental maps are produced by researchers, by and large, in the north. And they all look good. Maps look good, basically. But it doesn't necessarily mean they're used. It doesn't necessarily mean they are good. And it doesn't necessarily mean they will be used. This map here was produced in the 1950s by the Ethiopian Ministry of Health. And this is the map they use today. They have access to these other maps. Why do they use their old map? They believe their old map because they produced it. It basically builds on their expert knowledge. And to bring in another map from somewhere else, they have to own it. They have to say, this is our map somehow. So we can't just say, by producing new information, people are going to use that information. This is one of the tools we've developed for the President's Malaria Initiative. It's a very simple tool. It uses types of models that we've seen already, a basic transmission model. And um, its simplicity is in the fact that you just basically look at, for any point in Africa, the history of rainfall over the last 30 years, uh, the history of temperature, and the history of humidity, using the CRU um, uh, interpolated climate databases as the backdrop, as the information base. And what it does is it, it provides the information as a probability distribution. So you've got 30 years, and for every month, it says, of those 30 years, um, 10, 12, 15, or whatever, had sufficient rainfall or sufficient temperature to roughly uh, indicate that malaria transmission is possible in this type of environment. And we combine that information, produce this probability distribution, and then it's useful to uh, the President's Malaria Initiative for their logistics supply. Not because it provides them with perfect information, but it tells them the likelihood, i.e. in these months, it's maybe only 10 out of 30 years they'll get malaria transmission. It's a probability distribution. And that's more important than absolute information, because if you give absolute information about uh, what's going on, you're inevitably wrong. If you give probabilistic information, you always have the advantage of saying, well, it just has unlucky. But it also, in, it also encourages decision makers to understand the risk of uh, taking a decision in uncertain information. So this one here is just a little uh, example from Moshi in Tanzania. There's a transmission from the rainfall. This is what you would actually see if you clicked on the place. And this is what you would get for one particular year 
if you looked at clinical data from one of the um, hospitals. So seasonality, very, very important for control, very important for the timing of interventions. Here's an example from Eritrea with the malaria control team. And this was how they were organizing malaria control by region, the different colors of different regions. Those regions encompass highland areas, lowland areas, desert areas, very complicated uh, environment. And what we did with them was to work with them to use the health facility da da data, which researchers by and large don't like because it's very poor quality. But it's no, not such poor quality that it doesn't capture the seasonality of disease or the general intensity of disease. And so we could remap the country according to uh, areas with high transmission, the yellow and red, similar season, areas with low transmission, the green, and uh, similar season, and areas of orange transmission here, an intermediate area where the season is completely different. And as a consequence, they were able to reorganize their control planning around malaria itself and not just their administrative boundaries. If we look at the early development of early warning systems, and this is what really uh, got me involved in this, this is the 98 epidemic in uh, northeastern Kenya in uh, Wajir. And um, as you can see, it's a very dry environment uh, in northeastern Kenya. It's really goat herding and uh, what have you environment. Normally, they have virtually no malaria. Um, it's a very... Um, uh, the evidence for malaria here is that it's really imported cases. Rainfall is normally very low with a 97 uh, El Nino, um, which actually had resulted in huge amounts of rainfall in northeastern Kenya, massive local malaria epidemic. And you can see, just see in these very um, uh, semi-arid environments, they really respond, uh, malaria really responds to rainfall. And one of the things is to think about whether we can do something about it. This is one sad event is the Rwandan refugees moving into Tanzania. Uh, with a genocide and a uh, highly predictable malaria epidemic coming down the road because you had a non-immune population moving into an endemic area in Tanzania. Did they predict the epidemic? Did they get uh, malaria controlled into the camps in time? No. But it's absolutely predictable uh, that that was going to happen. Another thing that's absolutely predictable is that climate change adaptation will increase malaria in some areas. And that's because one of the major strategies is to imp improve water management uh, in dry areas and to get more uh, surface water for gardening and growing crops, etc., etc. And uh, there's plenty of evidence that um, uh, this type of water management increases uh, malaria. So, early warning systems uh, for malaria are not new. They've been used in India uh, over the last century, particularly in the Punjab, and there's a long, extensive literature and interesting literature on this. In particular, the, the uh, epidemics were associated with famines, and this is something this not just the rainfall, it's not just the mosquito, it's the vulnerability of the populations. And the uh, epidemics in India disappeared uh, really when they actually organized famine relief and particularly with the end of colonialization where the food extraction which was going on under the Brit British was stopped. And um, so India's epidemics really, uh, they had, used to have huge epidemics of malaria which was very much associated with their famine belt. Um, in Africa, Following the re-emergence and rollback malaria in particular, they had four um, global um, pillars, if you like, to the global malaria strategy. One of them was control of epidemic malaria. Uh, this was what um, uh, working with WHO and the epidemic um, technical team uh, was the um, model used or developed, if you like, to um, uh, start dealing with malaria epidemics. First on the list was understand the vulnerability of the population, which changes over time. Second, incorporate anything uh, that we could on the predictability of the climate. And this was done very much when we really didn't know that the seasonal forecast would be that useful, but we thought it looked like a good idea. And, um, and then actually just monitor the rainfall, monitor the environment, monitor uh, the surface water, etc. And finally, monitor, of course, what's happening in health facilities with patients. And of course, this is actually what really goes on. You wait and you have a, a warning of an epidemic because you have lots of sick people actually at the health uh, facility. The idea of the early warning system is to actually build some uh, heads up information uh, that will help in the development of the response. And uh, some of you will have seen this before, but this is work we did in Botswana, uh, where you have extremely good malaria data, and it's right on the edge of the malaria transmission zone. It responds incredibly uh, well to rainfall. This was what was going on in the um, 
uh, malaria between 1982 and 1986, a general upward increase in malaria uh, across the country with these uh, sort of occasional major epidemics, and then a policy change that was associated with rollback malaria, and the first epidemics meeting was actually in Gaborone in 1996, and immediately you can see the following year's malaria epidemics going down. So what we're able to do, actually, is to remove those trends and just look at the, the variability around the trends and see how, what their connection is to climate. And what you have is the gray bars are the um, variability in the from the trends in malaria. That's the anomalies. The black line is rainfall. It's a quadratic relationship, which I'm not going to show you, but it's actually very linear at the lower uh, levels of uh, malaria transmission. It's only when you get really high transmission that it sort of curves around. The dotted line um, is sea surface temperatures here in the El Nino region. And you can see sea surface temperatures predict the rainfall in Botswana. Botswana rainfall predict, predicts malaria. And there's a lot of work uh, that was done um, to try and use that information and actually build uh, an early warning system using seasonal climate forecasts, which could take into account those seasonal uh, those sea surface temperatures. And the results here, we have the same data again on malaria, the five high malaria years around the trend, the five low malaria years around the trend. And for the high malaria years, if you look at satellite data, you realize those five years are very wet. If you look at the seasonal forecasts, which actually come in before the rainy season, those forecasts were also for wet, or actually four out of the five years were for wet. Uh, if you look at the dry years, uh, the satellite data indicates five years of uh, drought. And also the seasonal forecasts, five out of five years also indicated drought. So that gave us some conf confidence that seasonal forecasting may be used in uh, malaria early warning systems and incorporated into planning cycles and what have you for malaria control. The work was done in collaboration with uh, WHO and the Southern African Malaria Control Unit and the, and the different countries. One of the challenges from a policy perspective is that seasonal forecasting is not uniform over the continent, and countries do not like products where, they can, where you say, yes, this will work in the north, but not in the south, or it'll work in March and April, but not in June and July, or on a Wednesday, or whatever. That's not good for policy. And so there's a challenge, fundamental challenge, on the seasonal forecasting side, because it's, in theory, very useful, and in specific areas, highly predictable, but it's not simple to incorporate it in a policy environment. But we are seeing that increasingly done so um, in different countries. Here's some uh, work that uh, you may have seen. We had already mentioned Caricho in the East African Highlands, um, where there's been a lot of work on and a lot of discussion about the longer term trends. And this was the original data from uh, Simon Hay et al. And here's the picture of the tier states, et cetera. And with all of the discussion on uh, warming in the East African Highlands, first of all, you need to think about what are the questions we're trying to answer. The first was, has malaria increased in the East African Highlands? And the answer to that was a resounding yes. Um, I was at the first epidemics uh, meeting. It was in Ethiopia. I think it was in 1998. Uh, and it was specifically a response to the fact that epidemics were being observed in Kenya, in Uganda, in Ethiopia, in Tanzania, in these highland areas. And uh, there's nobody's disputed that malaria increased in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s in the highlands. Has temperature increased in the East African highlands? That has proved an awful lot harder to actually answer. And this is partly the disconnect between climate research and actually what we know about what's happening on the ground. And um, you can't really answer the question uh, C or D if you don't know whether or not it's been warming, which is whether or not there are an increase in cases uh, in the East African highlands is related to warming and whether or not warming is related to what's happening on the global scale. So there's a lot of, lot of literature about this. In particular, you'll see this often cited, Paul Reiter in particular, but others as well. Uh, the original studies by Hay, they didn't see any observed changes in the trend and cited that a well-maintained meteorological record show no significant change in temperature over recent decades. So that has been a major part of the literature, that there was no change in temperature. And uh, one of the challenges has been that the data sets are used are these globally available data sets. And this is what happens as us, as global researchers, international researchers, we can access very easily the global data. It's much harder to access the local data. Uh, the UEA is an excellent data set, uh, particularly for uh, climate scientists 
to do large-scale climate science, but it's not quite so good at doing uh, detailed local analysis for one particular T state. And the reason for that is if you look in the data, uh, one is that the, sorry, I'll just go back to the slide here. This is what it looks like, and this is why I talk about it. This looks great. Grid points everywhere, nice colors, et cetera. But when you look at the underlying data, you realize there's very few MET stations that are actually represented in the data set, and even on some years, not that many. This is just for one particular month. It was in July 1988. 1998. So what happens, the climate scientists, when they don't have data, they collapse it back to the mean. So you tend not to see information if, um, if the data is poor. And uh, you can see that over the time period that the data set is available, or the early data set was available from the 19, um, early 1900s to uh, 2000 and so, uh, there's a big variation in the number of stations from which the temperature was available, or rainfall was available, or um, humidity uh, was available. And in fact, there, were no, there was no station information for vapor pressure at all, even though vapor pressure was described in writer's paper as detailed records on vapor pressure, et cetera. So actually understanding what's in the maps and in the data sets is incredibly important as part of the collaborative effort between climate scientists and health scientists. This was the first analysis by climate scientists that I have seen on East Africa, and it came out in 2009, sort of a long time after the big, all these discussions on uh, temperature. And it basically indicates warming, um, at least of minimum temperature, not of maximum temperature, uh, across Kenya. Uh, we worked with uh, the um, Kenyan uh, National Meteorological Agency, and um, my colleagues, uh, climate colleagues at the IRI, Judy Mumbo, led this paper. And coming from Kenya herself, that was incredibly important because it allowed her to engage directly with the National Met Services, give them confidence about the exchange of data and what we would do with the data. Uh, the data was accessed for Caricho itself. So this is the actual station data for Caricho. And you can see there are big problems uh, with the data sets in its raw form because you get these jumps. These jumps are associated sometimes with them moving the... Um, Met station, uh, there's standardized protocols within WMO and our climate scientists and the Met scientists that all uh, worked on the data uh, to produce quality controlled time series and that's the data that we've been able to use in the analysis. So this analysis then has as a backdrop, there's no actual climate malaria analysis in this, as the backdrop you have the malaria data from the Carucho uh, T estates. Uh, but the green line that you see is the actual minimum temperature from that particular station. And that green line is highly correlated, I think you can see it visually, with not only uh, the uh, tropical uh, land surface temperature, so that's the land surface temperature around the equator, but also the sea surface temperature uh, around the equator as well. And you can also see the impact of El Nino and La Nina effects, and this is the big 98 uh, 97, 98 El Nino, you can see the impact on minimum temperature, you can see the impact on malaria, and you can see the impact in all of the global data sets on temperature. Like that. So you can start to connect what's happening locally. I was amazed when I saw these results that you could actually see such a connection between one single station and what was going on uh, globally. Um, Daniel Rue is uh, uh, my uh, uh, PhD student who is doing the mechanistic model. He hopefully will... Be, um, be presenting his results uh, in the near future. And he's, by using a, a dynamical model or a, a mathematical model, you can start connecting both temperature and rainfall. Because if you only look at one, uh, you'll actually, um, you may overinterpret uh, what you're seeing. So is it important? Creatures at about 2,000 meters. So, and the Ethiopians use 2,000 meters as their cutoff point for epidemics. 2,000 meters, 800, 1,800 meters, or whatever. There's, people use altitude as a proxy for temperature, as a convenient proxy. Um, and there has been uh, some discussion, well, does it matter? It matters in some places quite a lot. Half of the Ethiopian population live above 2,000 meters. So they live in a potentially epidemic zone or a, a, a zone where you could have a big increase uh, from um, uh, warming, a, a inc potential increase from malaria in the region. It's very important to note actually what's happening with malaria though. Malaria hasn't been increasing since about 2004 in Caricho. This is the big declines in malaria that have been going on. And um, 
this is an important part of the control strategies and they that have moved into you know increase in bed nets changes in drugs uh, spray routines etc uh, there's a huge a huge effort to get in malaria control and hopefully this is evidence of the impact of that uh, control but it might not be the only thing that is affecting it and um, one of the things that's been going on in uh, East Africa and is really important in terms of trying to translate some of the climate uh, science work, particularly the long-term climate change, with actually policy. Because malaria control policy, when they started with the 1990, uh, 1998 rollback malaria, they had a 30-year time frame for malaria control in Africa, and uh, globally, but fundamentally in Africa. Uh, so that's a long time frame for uh, a decision maker in uh, a public health decision maker. But the day-to-day -day changes in policy, as you've seen, they change fairly rapidly over 5, 10, 15 year time periods. Uh, they have a much shorter thinking in terms of what you're actually going to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, so this is a climate change uh, uh, IPCC prediction that it's going to get wetter in East Africa, which may well be true. But when is it going to get wetter? Because this is actually what's been happening. This is Chris Funk's analysis of the uh, drought in Eastern Africa. And this, most importantly, is um, uh, work by uh, Brad Lyon and Dave DeWitt on um, uh, what's been going on in East Africa in terms of the temporal uh, patterns of the drought. And so you've had 10 years of drought. I think the, the discussion between these two uh, scientists, as far as I understand it, is that Chris Funk thinks this, is, this drought is part of a long-term slow decline uh, related to climate change in some way and that uh, uh, Brad Lyon and Dave DeWitt's view is that actually, no, this is a climate shift that happened really in 1990. There was a fairly constant climate until then, and then there's been a drop in uh, rainfall in the region, which itself should have big impact on uh, malaria. About a 15% drop in malaria. Uh, there was a 30 to 40% drop in rainfall in the Sahel during the major parts of the Sahelian drought, and as a result, we saw loss of vector species, major declines in malaria, changes in vector populations, etc. Does a 15% uh, drop in rainfall, is that going to have an impact on malaria? Undoubtedly, yes. But how much, how important relative to all those control issues, um, it's not clear. So if I ever am in a situation where I have to talk to policymakers about climate change and I only have one slide, this is the one I show them. Because it's such a challenge for people to understand long-term change, year-to-year -year variability, and then in particular the way that uh, decadal variability confounds uh, short-term policy, uh, well, even longish-term policymaking. Because if for malaria control they want a policy that's going to be for the next 10 years, do they look at longer-term change models? Do they look at uh, seasonal forecasting, or do they basically understand that decadal processes may affect um, rainfall much more than any of the longer-term uh, changes in their decision time frame? And that, at the moment, is not really predictable, as far as unless somebody here can uh, tell me uh, that it is. So that is a big challenge for control and control thinking. So uh, from a policy perspective, we need to think about multiple time frames and at the end of the day we have to focus on the time frame for which decision what types of decisions are relevant uh, for particular uh, disease control um, issues and mostly they're relevant within a four-year time frame if you're lucky a 10-year time frame and if it's unusual like malaria you might be thinking out 20 years 30 years and that will be really a thing around things like the vaccine development etc so um, the uh, last one on my list is uh, thinking about climate as a confounder. And this is really important now that we have those billion dollars going into malaria control. Before uh, the, um, you know, the previous uh, decades, where uh, in the 1990s, 1980s, there was very little money going into malaria research. There was very little money going into malaria control. Um, uh, I est estimated there was one uh, vector control state in Florida. You had much more resources for vector control than the whole of Africa. Um, and that was the reality. I mean, the, uh, so the whole issue about monitoring and surveillance and what have you was very poorly developed. But now that there are big resources going in, uh, people say, well, you know, where are those resources going? Co the, you know, the malaria control people have to answer to Congress. We gave you a billion dollars. How many kids' lives has it saved? That's really the bottom line. 
And uh, so it's very difficult to monitor changes in malaria when you, A, you don't know what the baseline malaria is to start with, really, you have a vague idea. And B, you don't know what the current malaria situation is, really, you just have a vague idea. And you have many, many confounding factors. So you can have the drought. Is the drought responsible for the decline in malaria? Maybe it's not the billion dollar intervention. Is um, it girls' education? Is it the vitamin A supplementation? Is it all sorts of other things? So the poor people in the monitoring and evaluation reference group uh, who have to develop strategies for trying to give a best estimation of um, the effectiveness of the, uh, of the resources that are now going into malaria control have to take into account confounders. And as a minimal list, these confounders include contextual factors such as the epidemiology of malaria and issues like climate. So how are they going to do that? How are they going to do that in a continent where it uh, has only less than an eighth of the, of the meteorological stations that are considered basic for running an observation system uh, by WMO? It's a big challenge. What's the way that it can confound? This is a study we did in Eritrea. Uh, there was the World Bank was he investing heavily in malaria control along with USAID. And uh, they published uh, this article, uh, how the malaria burden was successfully reduced in Brazil, Eritrea, India, and Vietnam based largely on this data, which was the incidence data uh, for the country uh, from 1996 uh, through to 2003. And Eritrea is very proud of the fact it was one of the first countries to achieve uh, initial goals. And uh, it has, uh, rightly, uh, you know, an effective malaria control program. Um, however, uh, one of the things that we pointed out was just to look at the NDVI for Eritrea at the same time. And as you can see, the NDVI and the malaria incidents actually match pretty well. And uh, basically what happened here, they used as their baseline year, 1999, because they always like to use a baseline. And after 1999, every other year was much drier. So if you have a baseline in a wet year and you're monitoring in dry years, you're pretty guaranteed success. Uh, we did a much more detailed study uh, with Patricia Graves, who did um, and was able to tease out the rainfall contribution to the decline and the intervention contribution to the decline. And it sort of came out about half and half. So they were definitely doing something good, but they were being helped on the way by the drought. And uh, so this is the formula that we've been developing with the President's Malaria Initiative, like how they should think about climate information in terms of... Uh, interventions, and that we need some estimate of um, is the climate suitability for malaria transmission increasing following the intervention, staying roughly the same, or decreasing? And to get some vague, vague idea about that, because if they don't incorporate an increase in climate suitability, they might underestimate the benefits of what they've been doing. And if they uh, don't uh, take account, like in Eritrea, that malaria transmission uh, suitability has decreased, then they may overestimate the benefits of their intervention. Now, you may say that's fine from a policy, uh, people like it. Malaria control managers love droughts. Everything works. They can go to the minister, say malaria's gone down. But you have the problem in three years later, the rain come back. The rains come back, and um, it looks like you haven't done a good job. So what we're trying to do is get them to use climate information routinely to improve their analysis. So A, they're not surprised either way. They account better. They can go to Congress, and nobody can say, well, what, it was driven by the drought. They can say, no, we've checked that out. And um, uh, we know that the drought only contributed X amount of the declining cases. So there are big policy gaps in um, uh, going between thinking about doing something with climate and malaria in Africa and doing something. And these gaps are at multiple levels. This was a report that we did for uh, the, the Department for International Development. And um, I'm not going to talk about it because I'm talking too long. But basically, the, the gaps on the policy uh, services, practice, and data side. And we need to get these communities uh, to work much more effectively together. I'm going to skip that and just go to this, which is what we're now doing to try and improve climate information availability and use in Africa. Our first uh, work is in Ethiopia. It's led here by our meteorologist Tufadinku, and it's to create high-quality uh, data sets at the national level, owned by uh, the government, uh, delivered through the National Meteorological Agency at much higher resolution, much better quality than anything you can get at the global scale. <laughs> 
and then to turn that information into products and services that can be used for development. This is the data. Here are the National Meteorological Stations for Ethiopia. Very good uh, station uh, set actually for any country in Africa. If you look at a global product, it probably incorporates about 14 MET stations for rainfall. If at the country level, there's about 600. Here's satellite data, pretty crude, gives you a nice overall picture. You combine the two together, you get the high quality of the observations plus the spatial structure of the satellite data. And that's, we've done the same thing for temperature, and now you have high resolution products which go back 30 years because it uses 30 years of Meteosat data, uh, and it can be at 10 daily resolution, and you can query it and make, I showed you this product previously um, that we use for PMI, but now you can click on it with much higher resolution data and, and look at uh, specific localities. You can also look at the trends in temperature. This is unprecedented now. Instead of waiting uh, 10 years to find out what was happening in one tier state, we can now see and click at any resolution that we want to across the country, uh, what's been happening on the temperature, what's the history of uh, rainfall anomalies. And we can use these to create pro products such as the weighted um, average, I'm sorry, my voice is running out. So uh, about basically this says here, in uh, Ethiopia, this is the intervention period, uh, 2000, no, this is the baseline period that they used, 2000 to 2005. This is the intervention period. The intervention period was wetter than the baseline. They don't have to worry about drought being an important part in Aromia. Um, and you can look at this at multiple spatial scales. And the same thing in Tanzania, you can see the changes in temperature and the history of rainfall. And you can get this. So this is important in Tanzania. In Tanzania, what you have, they use a baseline 95 to 2,000 for their malaria interventions. That happens to include the El Nino event with a huge amount of malaria. And the subsequent intervention period has these three major droughts in it. And in the literature, you'll see for Tanzania, they identified declines in malaria before the interventions. They identified changes from Gambia to Arabiensis before the interventions. So there's a problem about separating out what the impact of drought is in Tanzania uh, in terms of the control issues. And the key thing then, of course, is uh, having a population uh, that can use the information, understand the information locally to make products and services uh, that can affect their own decision making. And we do a lot on training. So with all of the work that is possible on climate, the most interesting thing and the one that's had the biggest traction so far with the health community is improving their own evaluations. And the reason why I think this is particularly important is it will get us, I think, uh, you'll see over the next two years, but every malaria control program in Africa looking at climate, just because they'll feel it's part of good practice uh, in terms of their accountability issues. And with that information, they'll also learn about their trends, their year-to-year -year variability, their seasonality, etc., without having to um, approach it in that way. And so there's a big change now in, in the African context in terms of engaging the policy side, the practice side, the creation of climate services, and uh, data. And uh, I'd like to thank you very much. Uh,